All right, so let's talk about the case against ethical egoism. Um, you know, Rachel shows, and I think if you look more closely, that the arguments for ethical egoism don't stand up. And, you know, honestly, that might be enough to reject ethical egoism, right? Because remember I said, well, ethical egoism is a really radical view. Really radical views need good arguments to support them. If it doesn't have them, that might be a pretty good reason to reject ethical egoism, right? Um, one thing I think is interesting here, you know, you might talk, um, people in the legal profession will talk about this, but philosophers do too. You might talk about the burden of proof, who needs to prove their case. And, you know, when we talk about ethical egoism, I think the burden of proof is probably on the ethical egoist. If they don't prove their case, well, it's not neutral, it's not a draw. That's a pretty good indication we shouldn't accept ethical egoism, right? Because it's such a radical doctrine that it's so at odds with common sense, right? But, you know, I guess it doesn't hurt to give an argument against egoism. And I think there's some things we can learn from looking at this argument against ethical egoism. Or actually, Rachel's will give us three different lines of argument against ethical egoism. And I want to look at each of these, you know. I'm not sure we should take ethical egoism so seriously, but some people do, so it's worth looking at the arguments against. Um, and so Rachel's gives us three lines of argument against ethical egoism. It endorses awful behavior. He says, you know, wickedness, I think, or extreme wickedness. We can just say awful behavior. It's inconsistent and it's arbitrary. Now, now look, I'm not even going to spend much time on the endorses awful behavior one because that's pretty simple, right? And it's pretty clear. Rachel's gives us some pretty clear examples, you know, of people doing absolutely terrible things out of, you know, self-interest. Not going to go through them again. They're pretty terrible the first time. Read the article again if you want to look at them. And you can think of, you know, Rachel's gives us some real world cases, some really terrible ones. You know, you can just think of a hypothetical case, right? You know, if you stood to inherit a lot of money when your uncle died, but, you know, your cousin is first in line for the money, he'll get it. When your uncle dies, you would, if the cousin was out of the way, well, the ethical egoist would say, well, if you get away with it, you know, offer to babysit and a uh, kid has a little accident, right? Obviously, that's completely terrible. That seems like what ethical egoism would endorse. Even, you know, we saw last lecture, even more refined forms of ethical egoism like Epicureanism, they might say somebody like that is too concerned with money, but even they would have to endorse some pretty shabby behavior, right? Don't help your friends when... There's nothing in it for you, right? So ethical egoism, even the refined forms like Epicureanism, seem to endorse some pretty bad behavior, and it's hard to avoid that. Now, Rachel's looks at this argument that egoism is inconsistent. Um, I'm not going to go through it again. Um, Rachel's goes into some detail. Um, he takes this argument from Kurt Beyer that says egoism is inconsistent. If you guys are interested, it's on page 78. Rachel's draws it out in a lot of detail. He has eight premises and a conclusion here. I'm not going to go into all that detail, right? The idea here is if ethical egoism were true, it would be our duty to do whatever is in our self-interest. But the thought is, what is in our self-interest is not going to be in the self-interest of others. So, you know, it's Joan's duty to try to get the money for himself. It's Smith's duty 
to try to keep Jones from getting it and getting it for himself, right? And the, the, you know, the contradiction here is, well, how could it be Smith's duty to stop Jones from fulfilling his duty, right? Now, Rachel's will say this argument doesn't work, you know, because it attributes to the egoist this claim that it's always wrong to try to prevent someone from doing their duty. The egoist wouldn't accept that, you know, premise five here. So this argument that egoism is inconsistent, Rachel says, isn't a good one. I'm not going to go through the argument in detail. If you guys want to, look on page 78. You know, the idea is, well, egoism, you know, will give different duties for different people. And it will say one person even has a duty to stop the other one. Rachel's thinks when you really get down to it, that's not inconsistent. Now, the thing is, and the reason I'm not going to spend that much time on the argument Rachel's rejects is because I actually think that egoism, or at least egoists, seem inconsistent in a way that Rachel's doesn't really see, right? I don't think there's this neat argument like Bayer gives, but I think there is an inconsistency in the way most egoists act. Now, think of it this way. When you blame another person, it's not just that you're mad at them, right? It's not just that you're angry. When you blame somebody for what they did, right? The very idea of blame seems to include this thought, this person has acted wrongly. They shouldn't have done this, right? You know, if somebody who's much more qualified for a job than I am puts the resume in and gets it, and I don't, I shouldn't blame him, right? That would be stupid to blame him, right? I might be sad he did it, I might be irritated, but I can't blame him and say, man, he shouldn't have acted this way, right? If he somehow, he's less qualified than I am, but he sabotages my application, say he tells lies about me, gets a friend of his to throw the application away or something, you know, then I can blame him. He's done something he shouldn't do, right? Well, why do I bring this up with the egoists? Well, I've actually had the misfortune of knowing a few people who claim to be ethical egoists. Um, In my graduate program, we actually had a guy who called himself an ethical egoist. He was a committed ethical egoist. He was actually a self-described follower of Ayn Rand. He was a card-carrying Randian. Um, This guy said that he was an ethical egoist and that everybody ought to be ethical egoists. Now, unsurprisingly, none of us liked this guy, right? Just, you know, he was the kind of horrible jerk you would expect someone who thinks he should always act in his own self-interest would be. Um... He actually made the secretary of the philosophy department, like, cry. She had to go off, cry for 30 minutes because this dude was so nasty to her. And if you knew her, she was just one of the nicest people I've ever known. So we hated, hated this guy. So why do I say this? Well, at one point, as a kind of make-work job, the philosophy department made him the philosophy department librarian. Now, really, this is a non-job. This is just like, look, we're going to give you this job because we don't want to give you any other job, and this gets you out of the way. Now, this guy, who I'll call Randy, his actual name was Al, but Al, I mean Randy, treated his library position as though he were the king of the library, right? You know, thing you'll find in life, the more pathetic the kingdom, often the more tyrannical the king, right? And so Randy would make up, like, all these, like, rules that we had to follow in the library. And we would ignore him, and he would get mad and generally be a pain in the neck to us. And one day he did this to a friend of mine. I'm not the person who actually did this. I would admit it if I were, actually. It probably doesn't speak well of me. I wish I had done this. But, you know, he tries to pull his non-existent rank on a friend of mine. And I forget what my friend was doing that irritated him. You know, they argue Randy is annoying, but 
Randy eventually has to go to the bathroom, right? So my friend, who I'm not going to give you his name, but you know, he he actually does teach ethics at a college now. Funnily, you know, amusingly enough. So my friend is still mad at Randy, and so what he does is this guy Randy, our ethical egoist, has left his backpack unattended. My friend goes and takes his backpack, you know, shoves it off into a side room in the very highest corner in the back of the room, puts some boxes in front of it, and leaves. Randy comes back. He goes through the roof. Who hid my backpack? The rest of us, like, what backpack, right? I didn't see any backpack. Do you have a backpack, Randy? I'm not, I'm not, maybe I'm not proud of this. I'm not as ashamed of it as maybe I should be, right? My point being, Randy, despite calling himself an egoist, was very, very angry. And he blamed all of this. You know, he's like, you know, he eventually found it. He, he cut such a, he hit through such a temper tantrum that I think somebody finally told him where it was. Look, why do I tell this story besides to pick on this guy. I tell this story because he blamed us, right? His very reaction was that he thought we shouldn't do this, right? We shouldn't laugh at him as he looks for his backpack. He, we didn't rat out the guy who did it, but whoever hid it shouldn't have hidden it. That's not a thing they should do to Randy, right? Randy blames us for not helping him. He blames the guy who hid it for hiding it, right? Here's the thing. It's not in any of our self-interest to help him, right? We don't like him. He's nasty to us, right? We are amused that he's so upset that he can't find his backpack. It's not in my friend who hid his backpack's interest not to do it, right? Randy's mean to him. He wants to get even. This is the way he gets even, right? Now, we may have, should have been nicer people, but if Randy is saying everyone should act in their self-interest, our self-interest is pretty clearly laughing at him as he looks for his backpack, right? Now, that might not be mature, good, nice behavior, you know, but it is self-interested, right? And if Randy is saying that we should only act in self-interest, it doesn't seem like he has any room to blame us. We are just doing what he says we should do, acting in our self-interest, laughing at him as he looks for his backpack, right? How can he blame us when he doesn't have any ground to say, well, we shouldn't do this? All he can say is, well, it's not very nice for me, it frustrates me, but if he says, well, you should do what's in your self-interest, our self-interest doesn't line up with his, right? So, you know, the few egoists I've ever met, the few self-described ones, they've all been like Randy. They blame people when people treat them badly. But in a lot of cases, treating them badly is in other people's self-interest. So it does seem inconsistent in a way to blame people like this. Now, look. Maybe there could be a consistent egoist if Randy came back from the bathroom and said, ah, oh, ha, ha, you've hit my backpack. Way to pursue your own self-interest. This sucks for me. I'll go look for it. I'll get even with you guys too later. Just you watch. If he had said that and not blamed us, then he would have been a consistent egoist. But the egoists I've just, I've met have not been consistent in that way. I'm not even sure a human being can be consistent that way. So I do think there's more of a case to be made that egoism, or at least most self-proclaimed ethical egoists, are inconsistent. Finally, egoism is arbitrary. Rachel spends a lot of time on this, but it's very hard to find an explanation why your interests matter and other people's don't, right? We'll talk about this when we talk about both utilitarianism and Kantianism. 
utilitarianism and Kantianism both will say, well, look, given the way you regard your own interests, you can't tell a story why you're special and your interests count and other people's don't. And if you can't tell that story, egoism just seems completely arbitrary, right? You think people deserve, you think you deserve respect from others. Even Randy thinks he deserves respect from others. Well, nothing makes you special. So if you think you deserve respect, you seem like you have to admit the same thing of others. You know, that will be the Kantian one, right? Utilitarianism, pleasure and pain is their thing. They'll say, well, look, you know what your pleasure feels like. It's good. You know what your pain feels like. It's bad. There's no story you can tell that makes your pain or your pleasure importantly different from others, that your pain is bad, your pleasure is good, but other people's doesn't matter, right? So lacking that story, egoism just does seem arbitrary. And we'll touch on this point more and more when we talk about Kantianism and utilitarianism. And I'll give one more argument against egoism that's not on Rachel's list. And this is just that ethical egoism seems self-defeating. People who aren't egoists will generally have better lives than egoists. You know, think about my story about the ethical egoist we knew, right? You know, whatever. We were, this was years ago. We were in our early 20s, you know. We were a little bit childish maybe still. You know, hopefully I'm a bit more mature now, right? But we hated this guy precisely because he was an egoist and tried to live up to the doctrine. And he was unhappy because everyone hated him. But everyone hated him because he was an egoist, right? His life would have went better. People wouldn't have hated him to the same degree had he not been an egoist. Egoism even in Randy's case, seems self-defeating, right? And think about, we can go a little deeper with this, right? What makes our lives worth living? A lot of it is caring about others, having relationships with others where you care about them. You care about your children if you have them. You care about your spouse. You care about people who are in clubs with you, right? You might even care about people half a world away that are involved in some charity you like, right? And, you know, imagine that somebody, you know, some mad scientist or evil, all-powerful character like Q from Star Trek. I guess Q wasn't evil. He was just mischievous, right? But whatever. Yes, there will be Star Trek examples in this class. Imagine that they offered to, like, snap their fingers and turn you into an egoist, somebody who only cares about yourself, most of us wouldn't do that because we think that being an egoist would be a bad life, right? Part of what makes our lives go well is caring about others for their own sake. If egoists can't do that, their own lives are not going to be as good as the lives of those of us who care about others for their own sake. So in a sense, ethical egoism seems self-defeating. It's not in your best interest to be an ethical egoist, probably. I do want to finish with some lingering questions, though. Because I think strong egoism, either psychological or ethical, is not ultimately going to hold up, right? But I think egoism raises some very interesting, some maybe disturbing questions that we should touch on as we go forward in the course and also that we should maybe try to get an answer to. And maybe one of those questions that's going to be interesting and we'll come back to again and again now, most of us think that Rand, Ayn Rand, draws a false dichotomy, right? It's not that we have to be complete altruists or give ourselves no 
or be complete egoists, we can give ourselves some preference while still taking into account the concerns of others. But how much? Where do we draw the line, right? You know, some cases are clear. If I see a child drowning in shallow water and I can save his life by getting my nice pants muddy and dirty, making my legs cold, I should save the child, right? I should sacrifice the interest I have in nice pants and not having cold legs to save a life. On the other hand, if I'm eating a delicious slice of pizza and some kid is staring at me because he wants one of my slices of pizza, well, even if he might enjoy the second slice of pizza more than I would, I'm under no obligation to give it to him. I can prefer my own interests to his to that degree, right? But there are all sorts of middle cases we might ask about, right? Think about Rachel's example of starving people elsewhere in the world. We could do a lot to help these people, but if we did everything we could to help others who are in a bad way elsewhere in the world, we would have to make major adjustments to our lives, right? You know, I could give $50 to help starving people elsewhere, but, well, why stop with the $150, right? If $150 will, then the next $50 will too, right? It seems like, you know, I can keep helping people a world away until I reach almost the same level they do. Well, it doesn't seem like we have to do that, but where would we draw the line? I can give $50 and save a life elsewhere, I should do it if doing that is giving up a really nice coat that I don't need, right? But if I actually have to move into a smaller apartment to give more money to help people elsewhere, do I have to do that? If I have to only wear clothes that I need to survive, do I have to do that to help others, right? So clearly we have to draw the line somewhere, but where? How do we balance our own interests? How much more heavily can we weigh them than the interests of others? Where do we draw the line? That'll be an interesting question that'll come up throughout the course. Kantianism, which we'll look at in a few weeks, will say one thing. Utilitarianism, which we'll look at sooner, will say another. But there is a real question how we draw this line. Here's another one. All other things being equal, it does seem rational to act in self-interest. What do I mean by rational? By rational, I mean if someone asks, well, why did you do that? Self-interest in a lot of cases will be a good answer, right? Why do you drink your cup of tea? I like the taste of tea, right? Well, but people will also claim, you know, or think of taking a class. Why are you taking this class? Well, it makes sense of your behavior. It explains it in a way that would justify it to others when you say, well, it's in my self-interest. If I get my associates, I can get a better job. I am interested in the subject and it gets me out of the house, right? Well, but it also... Moral theories will say it's rational to be moral, but then there's this conflict between morality and self-interest. How do we settle that conflict? If all things being equal, it's rational to act in self-interest, but it's also rational to be moral, what do we do the, with this fact that these two different things that both seem to justify actions in other cases, well, what do we do when they con conflict? Normally, moral theory will say, well, when they conflict, morality ought to trump self-interest. And that may well be right. I tend to think it is. But moral theories are going to have to give us a good account of why that is. 
So I think even though the argument for ethical egoism isn't going to stand up, I think ethical egoism raises some questions that we should take seriously. How much preference should we give to ourselves? Why should morality trump self-interest in this way that we normally think it does? All right, so we'll put egoism behind us, but these questions are going to pop up again in the course. I want you to keep them in mind.